there were a few discontinuities with the original recording of this lecture, so a few new sequences have been inserted in order to make sure that the material is communicated coherently. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for turning up on a night of uncertain weather and very strange vibrations, all in all. <laughs> Failing, I presume, that this idea, this title, The Circle of Perpetual Choirs, literally has some kind of resonance for you. And I've chosen to promote tonight with a bit of artwork that I commissioned from Yuri Leach to my design for my insanely ambitious book, Aquarium Phoenix, my work in progress of which you're going to be getting some kind of intimations tonight. This is not about hard-edged research. You know, this is at the furthest frontier of the so-called Earth Mysteries. Archaeologists, historians, abandon all hope before you enter into this. <laughs> There's no question that we're going into a visionary realm where lines on the map, mathematics, poetry, mysticism, magic, music, it's that liminal zone where they all somehow meet. That zone where, as far as I'm concerned, all the action is. I believe, you know, my meta perspective to lead in is that this concept of the perpetual choirs is a kind of archetype. Uh, John Michel, who we'll come to in a moment, spoke more than once about Jung's ideas about flying saucers that he wrote in a, a book towards the end of his life when he felt that the myth of things seen in the sky, whatever their apparent physicality or otherwise, is an indication of a change in the collective consciousness, the constellations that are arising from below the horizon, the thoughts, feelings, ideas that were maybe part of people's emotional language many, many ages ago and have been slightly forgotten are now coming back with renewed force. And I feel but there's something about that concept of the perpetual choirs that has a similar sense to it. And I hope that the material, and there's going to be an awful lot of it tonight that I discuss, will explain why I feel that way. So here's the man that we've obviously got to start with, John Michel, our greatest Earth Mysteries visionary. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about leads in from Two of his great works, so The Dimensions of Paradise originally was published as City of Revelation and then some considerable time later, 12 tribe numbers. <coughs> what you've broadly got running through all of John's work and very strongly expressed in these two is that there's the idea of a global tradition of a cosmology, a way of understanding how the world and the universe hangs together that combines mathematics, geometry, the laws of form and creation, and if it's understood correctly, it furnishes the means to live in harmony uh, and manifest heaven on earth. And Michel certainly always conveys this very strong indication, certainly there in his, his, his first really famous work view over at land is that all of this comes, it's a, a, a wisdom package, an ancient wisdom package from a vanished civilization and that initiates down for the ages have saved it, fragments of it, inspire the mystery schools. You know, that idea in itself has tremendous emotional power for many of us, uh, whatever can be done to kind of uh, deconstruct it. And there's no question that John Michel was very big on the great philosopher Plato. Um, it's it's kind of interesting to, to look at him from a modern perspective. You can almost, you know, you could say he's, he's the proto-fascist. You know, you can say that his philosophy is, is full of ideas about eugenics. There's a lot of things that you can 
find fault in him with from a modern perspective. But within all of this, there is uh, an expression of, again, uh, an archetype of, of traditional wisdom, if you like. And in one of his works called The Laws, he, he gives a kind of code for a, a utopia. And in that is the dimensions of an ideal city, and number, number is, is featured in this. And there's a great importance of music's role in the life of that ideal city, the use of, of what you might call an enchantment to create and sustain harmony. And, you know, the sacred music is created from mathematical, <laughs> geometrical cosmology. And the inhabitants of this ideal city will, will join chorus groups and they'll practice correct songs and dances and people that are too old for that will recite legends. They all <coughs> join together in a collective cultural life. And to maintain this enchantment that keeps the world in harmony, you have to continually repeat these traditional songs but within constantly changing forms that reflect the seasons, astrological cycles. And the way John Michel explains this in 12 Tribe Nations, uh, Plato was writing at a time where it seems that there were examples of this in Greece. Uh, and, and he goes on to extrapolate that in cases where you have uh, the number 12, people associate with the number 12, Moses and the tribes of Israel, Jesus and the Apostles, and then Joseph of Arimathea and Glastonbury. These are all examples of where a little bit of this wisdom package has come through. Now, what John Michel believed was that there are distinct elements of this tradition present in the geometry of the proportions of Stonehenge, which considerably predates Plato, and in the description of the New Jerusalem in the Book of Revelation, and in the ground plan of Glastonbury Abbey, as many of you will know, uh, John Michel considered that you know there, there is a, a connection between Glastonbury Abbey's geometry and stone engine as much as the later design is, is for the new epoch for the Christian era. Now again, I'm fully aware of the fact that academics can just rip this to pieces uh, and uh, there's a lot of things you can criticise in all the little details here. But when you're moved by these ideas, where can that take you? That's really the thing that I'm most concerned about here. I know uh, that this stuff is not academically sound. And I'm going to go on, I'm going to be talking about druidry and things like that. A whole bunch of contentious topics, but it's a feeling that is being conveyed by all this. Now there's a piece of what I would have to call Earth Mysteries Folklore and I cannot vouch for the authenticity of this story but I've heard it enough times, uh, let's say that it, you know, if it's mythological it has some kind of truth in it. The one night the Earth Mysteries researcher Paul Devereaux was awoken at some unsocial hour by a banging on his front door and it was John Michel under the influence of LSD, clutching some rolled up maps, frantically seeking admittance. You have to see this, was his opening line. And he spreads out a map on the floor and starts pointing to sites linked with stories of perpetual choirs having intuited a connection between them. Again, I can't remotely vouch for that, but it's such a great story that I have to include it. <laughs> so, it's in the original version of, of um, Dimensions of Paradise, City of Revelation, in 1972, that John talks about literature known as the Welsh Triads, supposedly of Dark Age provenance, which have references to three perpetual choirs of Britain, and they're named as, as being Glastonbury, Lackwick Major in South Wales, and Amesbury, which is very close to Stonehenge and inevitably calls it to mind. Now, I'm deliberately using here an illustration of Stonehenge, which is expressive of a whole enormous set of fantasies 
and romantic ideas uh, connected with it, you know, from the 18th, 19th, into the 20th century, which do not necessarily have any accuracy, but conjure up a mood. And I love the mood that this conjures up. So John is still saying in City of Revelation that uh, the places that he's, he's mentioned, Glastonbury, Amesbury, and that with Major, during Christian times, a hundred monks were chanting continually, changing over every hour, so that a total of 2,400 were involved. You know, this is all, in terms of the logistics, a little bit unlikely. They correspond to the 24 elders in Revelation who stand before the throne of the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of saints, and they sung a new song when the song changed and new age began. And John Michel had come to some sort of idea, intuited a, a relationship between the sites. And it involves the same numerical cosmology that we've mentioned relating to Glastonbury Abbey, Stonehenge, and also the Great Pyramid and the Grand Plain of, of New Jerusalem. In, this, in the case of the Perpetual Choirs, we've got the numbers 3168 and 5040 involved. Now, I'm not much of a number freak. I, I know there are plenty of big time number freaks in Glastonbury. A number of you, if you're interested in all this, it's all there in John Michel's work. You can examine this in tremendous detail. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly uh, just to convey a general sense of, of how it gets to all this. Because the numbers that he uses, and again, this is where the critics have a field day. There are measurements in different units, British inches, megalithic yards, furlongs, miles, and they all kind of interconnect. So for people that don't, you know, that like to diss Earth Mysteries research, we'll call it mystical landscape poetry maybe, and then we can get away with it, then we'll, we'll cut some slack on that. So very quickly, and it doesn't matter if you don't take all of this in, I don't take it all in unless I spend flipping weeks with it. 3168, the perimeter measurement of the temple. The New Jerusalem perimeter has got 3168 in it as well. The perimeter of the 12 Ides of Glastonbury has got a number with 31680 in it. The average perimeter of the Stone in Sarsen Circle, 316.8 feet. The perimeter of Plato's ideal city, 31680. And Plato's ideal city contained 5,040 inhabitants and a circle with a circumference of 31680 has a radius of 5040. Again, somebody somewhere would have trashed the hell out of all these figures, but I'm just presenting it as is. <coughs> Glastonbury Abbey's axis appears to be orientated to Stonehenge, which is 39 miles or 316.8 furlongs away, which is also the distance between Glastonbury Abbey and Landwick Major. And if you draw a line between those three sites, you get an angle. John Michel says it's about 144 degrees. But obviously, hard edge research, about 144 degrees, doesn't cut it. But again, we'll cut him some slack here. So that's 12 times 12, a classic New Jerusalem number. And you continue, you know, this is the, the insight that he had. You've got this gradually developing uh, set of angles, these three sites. What if you, what if you just carry on going? What if you do the same thing, 316.8 furlongs, in the carrying on from Stonehenge, you get to Goring on Thames, where there's a river crossing of a number of ancient tracks, and he carries on, you know, because 144 is the number of degrees in a ten-sided figure, a decagon. So if you took that, the four sites, Landwind, Major, Glastonbury, Amesbury and Goring on Thames as four sites of a ten-sided figure, you find that the centre of it is at Midsummer Hill, a white-leaved oak, which is near Ledbury in the Malvern Hills, a very ancient rock formation, you know, right in the centre of England. And if you made a circle from white-leaved oak with the choirs on its perimeter, the circumference is 3168 furlongs and the radius 504. That's the densest amount of stuff I'm going to lay on you tonight. It all opens up, chills out considerably after that, so don't worry. 
Now the idea, and this is a very recent version by the way, um, the, one of the better versions that I could find on the internet just to give you a kind of sense of it. It's come out of it in 1972, it's a bit of a slow burner. It does circulate amongst landscape geometry enthusiasts, you do find it appearing in one or two books. In the early 80s, a friend of Andrew Collins, a London-based earth mysteries researcher called John Merritt, uh, decided to investigate the other sites on the Decagon a little bit further. And he wrote an article in Andrew Collins' EarthQuest News publication, I think in about 1985. And he kind of looked in the broad areas, suggested sites, made a few adjustments here and there. He never thought that it was um, the final result, but it was workable. What I mean by workable will become clear as, as we go on. Now, the sites that, that he comes up with are not exactly the same sites. As, I don't even know if you can see the writing on there. You've just got the general uh, geometrical shape and where it roughly lines in, in the landscape. The sites John Merrin came up with, which I became heavily involved with, are not exactly the same, but they were Glastonbury, uh, a Lagwick nature, a place called Landovery, uh, where there's some castle ruins, a place called uh, at Mayford called the Hill of the Ancients in Orsley Street, a place that John called the Lake of Light in Shropshire. That's uh, the, if you went there, uh, you might be a little bit underwhelmed, but he called it the Lake of Light. Chartley Castle in Staffordshire. Croft Hill in Leicestershire, a place called King Standing Oak in Brick Hill, Wood Mill and Keynes, and in Grimsditch, Goring on Thames, Amesbury Stonehenge. So again, you know, you could find this stuff, uh, but it's just the sense that there are interesting places, and obviously they're not archaeologically verifiable. Obviously they're inexact, and from all points of, of conventional points of view, they're nonsense. And these Welsh triads are famous for being very, very dubious material from an academic point of view. And it, it even looks as if John Michel might have, might have bent things a little bit to make it fit his pattern, which is not the first time that he's been accused of doing that. There's a guy called Jeff Simmons who's done a tremendous amount of work, and you can find it online here and there, in which he's attempted to go into the roots of this material that's contained in the Welsh Triads. How far back does it go? Where else can you find it? Uh, he's come to some interesting conclusions. Uh, basically, you know, from our point of view, a bunch of people gathered in Glastonbury, uh, it's mystically vibing, it's a goer. If you decide that you want to start interacting with this, the chances are that things are going to start happening. You know, it is a visionary realm of perception. There's no doubt about it. So what about white leaf dope then? It's got that name for a reason. Uh, now these days, there is one old oak, it's not a white-leaved oak, which has become the centre of attention and veneration um, over the last 20 years. More and more and more people go into this, and if you went to it now, you would find obvious signs that it is, it is regularly visited. But it does say that in Right up into the 19th century, there was an unusual species of oak that did have white leaves. There are a few examples of it there. They were venerated uh, with all kinds of weird folk traditions that your typical 19th century antiquarians would inevitably link with the Druids. And there came a point where some local person got the ump about it, and one of these oaks was, was chopped down, uh, which is obviously you know, a hell of a shame. But that's where the name comes from. And it's handy that there is actually in the area um, one particular oak that, that has become the focus of the energy and the attention. But you would expect, if this thing is a goer, if there's any reality here, that the whole area around it will be somewhere pretty special if it's the centre of the circle of perpetual choirs, of which a place like Glastonbury is just one of them. And there's no question you know, that the Mulvans is a tremendously powerful, evocative, um, very easy to get, you know, a, a mystic sensibilities evoked by being out in landscapes like this. Now, one of the things that expands this, this whole inquiry uh, just that little bit further is the fact that you can see um, all of these things pointing up to the 
the, the top there in the middle white leaf note but around that area are the sites of the Three Choirs Festival which is a very interesting um, gathering that, that changes its location between the, those three places uh, Worcester, Herefordshire, Hereford and, and Gloucester uh, every year and it's been going since the 17th century and over the years, certainly at uh, the start of the 20th century, it's had some, some very kind of powerful cultural resonances in the wider life of the nation. Now here's Edward Elgar. Now uh, Elgar is unfortunately probably best known for pomp and circumstance, land of over glory, last night of proms, and has got himself lumbered with this reputation of being a bit jingoistic and of an old imperial past that is well past its sell by day. And that's really not fair on the guy at all because that's not where he was at. He was in fact uh, a very mystical person, uh, very in tune with the landscape. And I don't know, maybe some of you might remember um, a famous uh, film made for the BBC by Ken Russell before he went uh, completely bonkers and started having, you know, naked nuns and uh, all that sort of stuff arriving about in his film productions. In 1962, he did a wonderful piece about an hour long on Elgar, and there's, there's a scene uh, of the young Elgar uh, fishing. And Elgar later said that he, he, he could hear music, as it were, coming out of the land, coming out of the landscape. Uh, in certain respects, he was trying to write down what the reeds were saying. Uh, and there's a wonderful sequence in Ken Russell's film where he's riding along the Malverns, along the hills on this pony when he's a child. And, and yeah, he said that he, he had some kind of sense that literally, you know, the hills were alive with the sound of music. He could hear, he could feel this musical feeling everywhere around him. And at one point, you know, he wrote, the trees are singing my music, or have I sung theirs? So this, this is something that's brought up in around the broad area of the centre of the circle of perpetual quiet and his music as it has it's quite clear that he felt he was expressing something of the landscape itself and a lot of that music entered more widely into our collective consciousness. And the first premiere of, of Ralph Ford Williams incredibly evocative fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis, which is a real pace of landscape music, if ever there was something that, that took you into the land and into the ancestors and into a transcendent realm, it's that. The premiere of that was at the 1910 um, Free Choirs Festival in, in Gloucester. So there's now, you know, as I say, that liminal interface between magic, mysticism, art, music, poetry, the whole thing. There's something very mysterious going on there, and if we resist the temptation to try and just label it and, and, and limit it, then we might find that we can go quite a long way with it. So in 1990, uh, as some of you will know, uh, Andrew Collins had some incredible experiences in the Glastonbury Zodiac in the 80s, which I ultimately got, got to write about in my Avalonian Eel. And he wondered to what extent this material would uh, work with other people other than just his own vision quest, psychic quest experience. So he, the group of us that were involved with him uh, in psychic quest at the time, he decided to take us around the Glastonbury Zodiac on what turned out to be a 36 hour vision quest intensive, which uh, you know I've talked about some of this on lots of occasions, you know, thrown, threw myself in the rear of Baltimore flights at midnight, you know, stayed awake all night, I did any sleep for 36 hours. Meditations and visualizations constantly at loads and loads and loads of sites. In the end, having had just a few hours sleep, we got up at three o'clock in the morning for uh, the climax of the whole thing where we went to an apple orchard in Butley at the centre of the Glastonbury Zodiac and Andy sort of took us so far on it with his own visionary material which had seen him climbing on board the ship of Solomon and going into some um, crystal lattice matrix at the heart of creation where the three pulsing notes of the, 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 the total uh, creation sound of the universe were happening 
you know, where he got an, an immense download that's had a huge effect on the rest of his life. He used that imagery and then left the rest of us at that point to have our own experience. Now I was primed, you know, I, I'd, I'd read every single thing I possibly could on the Glastonbury Zodiac and I was primed with the idea also in the background with the Perpetual Choir, you know, I, I'd already thought and felt deeply about this. I've got this sense of, of the landscape music and Paul Williams and Elgar and all the rest of it. So I was nicely primed, but after 36 hours in this incredibly intensive state, uh, what I had in my head <coughs> coalesced with, with tremendous emotion. So the, the vision, if you like, that I had at the end of all of this uh, completely and, and utterly overwhelmed me. And I'm so glad of the fact that you know, we got back to the B and B we were in at about quarter five in the morning, and just a couple of hours sleep. And before coming down for breakfast, I just wrote straight down what it was that I felt I had experienced, and how that whole zodiac quest had come together. And this is one of the you know the fundamental things <coughs> in the narrative of, of Avalonian Eon. I saw a Glastonbury solstice dawn symbolic dawn, dawn of the Aquarian age, the new eon, the new age. Mists of Avalon are rising from the ground, vaporising into the air as they roll across the land. The Tor, the Abbey, Chalice Well, a hum like organ music, gently but powerfully rising. A sense of the Abbey's perpetual choir, Celestial voices are emerging from the hum. On this new turn of the time spiral, other voices join the monks of the Celtic Church. There are Native American and Indian intonations. Bells, at first sounding Christian, but then reverberating Tibetan style sound a background. This dawn will bring a great awakening and what we've done, our vision quest, purging and purifying ourselves, traversing the zodiac in set sequence, we're in the same dawn, adding a tone to the great choir, an old tone that was known before, added again, but different in the way it relates to the greater whole, as this is a new era. What we've done, whatever individuals may or may not have got from it, has contributed to the rising choir. Glastonbury is waking. Now the tour, a glass aisle, a hollow hill filled with elementals, ancestors, fairy folk, vast angelic forms, watchers of Avalon are on guard. The monks of the Company of Avalon are smiling as the Abbey Chalice World Current is absorbed into the beak of the Aquarian Phoenix, the fire heart rising with the sun. In underground tunnels beneath the town, through the whole ground, the great humming sounds. All around, in enchanted sleep, are the dreamers. 75,000 at the festival, the mystics in Glastonbury itself. Because of all these people, and us, and what we've done, the choir sings louder, and the inner bodies of those with right intentions are responding and resonating. Messages are being left deep inside. They are all singers of the soul, though they carry different notes, different lines of the soul. The more and the further they spread the notes and different lines of the soul, the more people may start to hear the whole soul. As they gather at places like Glastonbury, the whole song will be heard more and more, louder and louder. We must resonate together. And a part of our task is to revitalise the tuning forks of stone and the wind chimes of water that are the energy matrix of Britain. A hundredth monkey point will come in this process. The more it happens, the less anyone can do to stop it. And at the quantum leap point, bang, we're there, we're everywhere. It's all true. All that the visionaries have ever said of Glastonbury, it really is all true. And I'm so glad that I wrote that down then. Uh, that was that whole experience, that 36.
the great visionary of our psychic questing group at the time was Debbie Benstead, Deborah Cartwright, as she now is. She was only 22 years old in 1990, and she had already demonstrated a very unusual talent regarding all things musical. There was one great example of that, that particular year. There was an occasion when we were all chilling out somewhere outdoors where two of the girls in the group, Lisa and Kerry, were singing that well-known chant to the goddess, we're all part of the goddess. And Debbie instantly replied to them in response, why are you only singing some of the words? The obvious question, what other words are there? She immediately sang back a whole new version of the song which appeared to be indebted to certain parts of Dion Fortune's Sea Priestess and also contained things that were entirely unknown. And it was incredible. It was something that made your hair stand on end. And Debbie immediately taught the soul to the sisters. And at a later date, it was actually recorded for posterity. So this was part of Deb's talent. And at that time, just as we were heading off on our travels, the New Musical Express had actually done a little feature on psychic questing. It literally come out on the very day that we left for our Glastonbury extravaganza. And there was a picture of, of Deb in there, so she's captured for posterity at that time. When we were on Wirial Hill, in the so-called Castle of the Fisher King, as we were experiencing it at the time, Deb said that she could hear some music being played. And it was as if it was being played on some old-fashioned harpsichord. And it was the Fisher King's. So, and it was the sound of the music from the change from one astrological age to the next. Astrological epoch into the next. And in this case, it was what had happened essentially 2,000 years ago. It was the transition into uh, the age of Pisces. And we thought, well, okay, that's great. You know, you can hear that. That's very evocative. Um, you know, we can't hear that but so be it. Now, when the whole thing was concluded, on the same morning that I've written my uh, whole thing down, and we've had our breakfast and we've finished it, we go into town, by then it's the 24th of June, so that's actually the face of St John the Baptist. Uh, so we went into St John's to give him a nod, and there's piano in there. And Deb says, uh, oh, I can still hear that music, the Fisher King song. Uh, I think I can play it on the piano. Shall I give it a go? So of course we said, yes, come on, let's hear it. And we're very fortunate because, you know, this was these days, mobile phones, digital era, we'd have a fantastic version of it. Everybody there would have just all recorded it. At that time, Andy used to have a, a walkman with him and a, and a microphone, and he just recorded everybody that everything that everybody said. And it was because of those tapes that I was actually able to write Abalone Neil. Uh, I think there were three C90s full of stuff that I had to transcribe in their entirety and then edit down. And then uh, that's one of the reasons why it took me 10 years to do it. But, it's a little bit on the tinny side, it's only been recorded on a Walkman, but you, 
We've got we're here, haven't we? We've got here the fish king song. It's only about a, about a minute long. And the voices are a bit tinny. But right, the fish king song. <coughs> Imagine if you've been for a 36 hour vision quest intensive, you've mashed your brain, you've jumped into the boards for flights at midnight, you've been in the apple orchard at dawn, uh, and then you hear that, you know. Now, later on, oh, it's, it's such a pain to me that we lost the details of this. Andy, Andy Collins has got, got a friend uh, who's a bit of a boffin called Rodney Hale, uh, amazing guy. Uh, invented some gizmos for an early James Bond film, I think, and has done all kinds of work with Andy uh, relating to his work on, on sickness and alignments and so on. And he passed on the recording of this to some mate of his in new music, and he said that there was something quite intriguing about it, that it had something in common with a form of uh, liturgical music from the time of around about the 5th century in Ireland, which is, of course, the time of the mythical time of St Bridget and Patrick are, are very much associated with the beginnings of the Abbey. So very appropriate to the idea of the changeover from one eel to another. But the thing that really struck me more than anything else was the idea that this music was just hanging in the airwaves. The perpetual choir is still singing. You know, it has never ever stopped. And what you know, people of whatever temperament, you know, whatever predisposition, uh, at wonderful moments in their life might be able to hear it or to hear some of it, to hear something. Now Deb's talent was exceptional, <coughs> so she was able to get that. But that idea that maybe there is there is just something twenty four seven in the airways around here that there truly is something absolutely astonishing going on and obviously as far as I was concerned it was proved you know when you've been in the midst of something like all of that so you know I, I've discussed this tremendously in Avalonian Eel and cutting a very long story short um, the narrative the main narrative payoff in Avalonian Eel is in July 1992 when I'd had a whole series of weird ones leading me to feel that I needed to come here round about the time of what I'll call Robert Anton Wilson's Cosmic Trigger Day, round about July the 23rd, to do a whole thing with the energies of Isis and Sirius and bringing it down into the Glastonbury Zodiac. And then, and this is pre-internet pre days, <coughs> uh, it would have worked totally differently now. I discovered that the, the same weekend I was going to do it was the second part, if you like, of the harmonic convergence. It was a date set up by Jose Arguelles as being one of the big pointers towards 2012, and there was going to be a whole load of stuff with that going on at the same time. And I only found out about this on the way down there, and when we were there, um, camped at a uh, camping site, and one of the people that we were with at dawn said that she felt this enormous great arm coming up through the ground. It was like so powerful, it was like shaking the whole ground. And I thought, well, what on earth happened last night? We went into town the next morning, the Sunday morning, saw posters that as part of this of Welly's mind calendar doodah, there was going to be an arm sounded on the tour at dawn. And I thought, wow, you know, that worked. But beyond that, when I'd done the Zodiac Quest in 1990, 
I, I didn't even know about the old web convergence. It's amazing that I could have missed something that epic in this day and age with, with the internet. You never would. But I only found out about it in 1991, and I realised that my vision, if you like, if I wanted to put a title on it, I could almost call it harmonic convergence. It was like this vision's becoming real. This whole thing about the great harm coming up through the ground and all the rest of it. I've now actually been part of a little bit of the unfolding of this. This is real, you know, pay attention and go along with this idea that it is becoming real. So by the mid 90s I'm living in Glastonbury and uh, after a few years where I hadn't been having much to do with psychic questing, um, I was back on board with, with Andy and the whole crew. And I was very conscious that living in Glastonbury, it's the most, what you might call, functioning of all the natural choir sites. It's the place where the most amount of activity and energy is, is, is being generated. And I started to feel that the choir might need a bit of a tune-up, and that something of all this was going to be an expansion of my 1990 vision. And I started reading John Michel again, and he was very clear that the vision of the grail and the enchantment of the land kind of go together. Uh, and, and this seems, you know, very resonant with my, my own experiences. And I remember that, you know, I'd been to Whiteleaf Doak. Um, before we'd done the Glastonbury Zodiac Quest, we'd all gone there in 1989 uh, for reasons that will become clear in a minute. But I, had a, I'd had a, I always remember having conversations with Andy there in which we were sort of wondering what are we what are we doing what is the bigger part of the work we're doing and the feeling was we were working with the matter of britain we were working with the mythology of our landscape and we were vibing it up if you like and trying to vibe it up all around the world other people in their own places uh, you know the same kind of thing was happening the matter of egypt was was stirring uh, and you know we weren't hit to it then, but clearly the Mayan calendar stuff, the the, tr the indigenous traditions were all stirring, and there was going to come a point where the matter of Britain joined in with the matter of the world, where you know there was some kind of global thing where everybody's uh, distinct thing was a contribution to a greater whole, a greater unity, and that this was part of the greater work. And at that point, it was obvious to think, you know, everything was looking towards 1999, and we, we used to talk about the world party on New Year's Eve 1999. Yeah, I mean, little did we know then that God, that world party was going to be Jean Michel Jean getting a bunch of people dressed up as penguins to walk out of the desert in Egypt. So that's the biggest step down in the old history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I was living in Glastonbury, you know, I was joyfully cosmic. Uh, I had this sense of the arm of the earth and that the arm of the earth was kind of dying. The whales are part of the perpetual choir, man, you know, they're sounding the great arm of the earth. And the dawn chorus, I've always loved the dawn chorus. When I was lived in South End, there was a tree um, outside my front door that got cut down because the neighbours had complained to the camps about the sound of birds were making it in the early morning. And, uh, that's one of the reasons why I had to leave Essex because I, especially at this time of the year in June, I love being kind of just woken up by the sound of the birdies at about four o'clock in the morning and then drifting back down into it again. That to me is just a good paradise. I love that. And there are people who hate it. So what, you know, this was a sign that all was not well and that something needed to be to be healed. Now this is, uh, if you've ever, ever come across uh, the Dragon Project, this is some work that was, was done in the 80s by, uh, by Paul Devereaux and company and, and Don Robbins got a couple of well decent books out about it. This is stuff that actually the scientists have got something that dig their teeth into it because they did all kinds of monitoring of stone circles, particularly the roll ride stones was, was the one place that they really gave a lot of attention to. And it seems that they generate um, an unusual amount of ultrasound at dawn, you know, more than the background landscape. Uh, and again, this, this sense that I had of it was that there's a kind of great tone, a great orb of the earth, if you like, and that the ancients had some kind of sense of that and, and the, 
we needed to recover that. We needed to recover that, and our own human consciousness is actually a part of that tone. And I wondered, you know, with all the sounds and geometry, the kind of things that you find with the, the Clatney plates where you put sound or, or, or uh, you put sand on a plate and you play a uh, violin and it produces various patterns and so on. Did, did the chance of these perpetual choirs create geometric forms in space that we're not aware of and through the ground? You know, all these kind of wild ideas. And I also had this feeling of um, the mythology, we'll call it the mythology of Glastonbury, that when the early Christians came here, there, there was a common language of some kind with the Druids that were here. And again, we say with the Druids that were here. You can't really say that there's a stone of archaeology, you know, a blot of parchment, of ink on a parchment anywhere that conclusively proves that, that there, this place was a Druid centre. I think the inference is massively strong. I totally <coughs> believe it was. But, you know, it's another one of those, those little things that you simply can't, can't anchor and yet we take it for granted here. But the famous Celtic church of which you hear so much, uh, there is, you know, that sense, you get it in a lot of books, you certainly get it in a lot of books in the late 19th century, the 20th century, there's a continuity there. And we know, you know, one of the, the really interesting uh, bits of real history from the Abbey is when the first Norman abbot, Thurston, tried to impose um, a new type of liturgical chant and it was, was resisted mightily by the, the monks that were already there, of course essentially Saxons. And the whole thing got to such a level of intensity that the soldiers were cut and sent in and monks were actually killed with bows and arrows in Glastonbury Abbey over this issue and Thurston, you know, he, was actually sent back to Normandy by William the Conqueror. Now, after a while, he was forgiven and he came back again. But all this stuff was kind of ticking over in my head as a, as a whole great sort of ferment of different ideas. Now, I've talked about psychic questing. I've talked about the work with Andy. Um, some of you will at least know that um, some swords were involved. Uh, that early on in his career, Andy had, had found um, a sort of, a, a kind of short sword, ceremonial sword of some kind, in very strange circumstances. And before long, the idea arose that there were a whole bunch of them, that there was a set of seven that were going to be found. And, you know, during my time of knowing him, it went, you know, from there having been three to four, five, six, and then we got heavily involved in this quest for seven of them. And how that all came about, and how we eventually found the Seventh Sword, is all in Avalonia Neal in tremendous detail. Now, my Queer and Phoenix project is like, well, what did we do with them once we've gone? You know, there was some purpose that they all had. And the psychics that Andy were, in particular, a, a remarkable man called Bernard in the 1980s, and we'll, we'll come back to him again, uh, big time in a minute. He had this sense of, there was a place that he called the Heart of the Rose, in the centre of the English landscape, uh, and there's a there's a tapestry by Bert Jones called the Heart of the Rose that, that we adopted as our kind of iconography of this whole process. And these seven souls were going to be brought together seven times at the Heart of the Rose, and an ongoing uh, you know interaction with the landscape energies and all the magic that we've been working with would occur over a period of seven years which indeed it did and it mutated mightily. Um, the first one was almost a kind of um, seven sorrows of the Virgin Mary and Catholic saints and all the rest of it. It worked its way through till in the end the enmeshed spenders of Zoroastrianism and Mayan pyramids and ancient Egyptians and all sorts came into the blend. But basically the heart of Rose is what they've dug. You know, so from 1992 to 1998 and in company, and I was on board for the last three of these, uh, made their way around the Lammas period to this area, and all kinds of stuff went down. And I had a, you know, had a sense that I had um, a profound involvement in this, somewhere as it came to its conclusion, that I had to bring my own sensibilities to bear on it. And, and it continued to sort of, in the back of my head, what happened to me in 1990. 
And I was, to a certain extent, inspired by, by Black Elk, who uh, I'd studied uh, during my comparative religion course at university. Um, famous for having had amazing shamanic experiences from an early age, about the age of nine. He'd seen a great tree that was the life of the world and its people. And the world tree is a classic mythic motif in, in itself. And he identified, you know, this, this really fundamental thing with the shaman, that the shaman goes away from the world, gets the vision, and then has to return to the tribe and somehow heal the tribe with the vision. And, you know, Black Elk's a great example of that because he grew up uh, during a time of tremendous tribulation for his people. You know, he was actually present at a battle, a little bigger, was a, as a little child. He was present at a wounded knee. By the age of 15, in between those two events, uh, he was tr treated with tr sufficient respect by the tribal elders that they respected the visions that he'd had as a small child and actually acted out one of these visions, created one of them, a hall starts. You know, they created a sacred teepee, they painted the sort of details from his vision, they got real horses in, they got people representing parts of, of the vision, and songs that he got in the vision were actually performed, and this is just classic, definitive stuff. And I just thought, well, what, you know, this 1990 thing, what the hell can I do with that in the middle of everything that I'm working with? How can I make it more real? Now at this time, um, and he was, uh, yeah, my attention was being drawn once again, big time towards the whole Morven mystery. And he was working on Gods of Eden. Um, this came out in the mid '90s, but it included a whole bunch of stuff from his, his earlier adventures in the '80s that I was already familiar with when I did the Glastonbury Zodiac quest. And this had started off uh, primarily. Uh, dynamised by an incredible psychic called Bernard with a saga that was to Andy a past life saga, Medieval Nights, this was a painting uh, from Bernard um, in the Glastonbury landscape, people that turned out to, you know, strange names that he just came up with out of nowhere like on Old Merrick de St. Moore, who's the figure represented on the left of the two knights turned out to be the master of the Knights Templars in England at the time of the Knights Templar and was quite present in this part of the world during that time. You know, Bernard could just come out with names, he'd come up with details of heraldry, he could come up with all sorts of stuff that was, you can anchor it in the real world. And it led Andy into, into a, a, an incredible mystic quest. And that old chestnut, the design on the floor of the Mary Chapel, Bernard saw it and drew his own version of it. And, and that's it in, as, rep, as reproduced in Avalonian Neal. And the detail that he had, the thing that he came up with was that the, the monks would look at it in a visionary state. They'd try and meditate on it in a certain way. And once they locked into it, it would start moving. You know, you've got bits on the, you've got different layers in there. Some of it would start moving round in one direction. Some of it would start moving round in another direction. Different colours would come out of it, deal with all these kind of sounds. You know, it was absolutely amazing stuff. Uh, and glad. Andy and Bernard's Clash to be Zodiac material reminds for me the best stuff that I've ever heard um, on this subject. It still continues to blow me away decades after I first heard it, but that was only the start of it. Because one day Bernard was, you know, thinking about the Mary Chapel, thinking about this design, and he suddenly said, now, is there something underneath the Giza Plateau? Now this is this is 1984, okay, so this is quite early in the proceedings, you know, this idea picks up an awful lot of momentum as we get towards the millennium and since then. You've obviously got a little bit of stuff there, case and so on, the idea that maybe there's some mystery beneath the Giza Plateau. But this is where Bernard comes into his own, you know, he's been totally spot on with medieval history, he's been totally spot on with all kinds of stuff that you can check. And then he starts to come up with something very, very strange indeed. Way, 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 way back, uh, there's an island in what is now the middle of the Giza Plateau, 
where the Sphinx now is. And it's kind of mound of creation. And, you know, you cross over uh, a lake to get to it. Now this was, this was something in the end, we did meditation visualizations on this so many times. We went into this place loads and loads of times. It was a central part of our psychic quest in mythology, if you like. And here's the whole, when you actually get onto this island, you know, there's an entrance, there's a hall, there's a processional way. And this is a little scribble, 17th of July 1985, Bernard's shown this, this sculpture uh, on the door of the entrance and the figure of a priest. Standing there before it, and this is what Yuri did with that. Uh, for Avalonia Neal, you know, it's a shame Yuri, you know, he's otherwise engaged on Wednesday night. Uh, the work that he's done uh, is so exceptional, so exceptional, as I'm, I'm sure we all know. Bernard Dunn did some drawings, did some paintings in uh, 1985 of the full blown uh, version of this. Black and white versions of it were, were shown in Gods of Eden. This is the whole. And then, what you've got, if you remember, there are, there are 12 chambers around uh, a central point. Uh, each one of these 12 chambers is basically like this. And what you, they all point towards, you know, you can see one central line in the middle is pointing towards the middle of the chamber and the other, to the left and the right, are connected with the other chambers at either side. And what would happen is the people that were in there would stand in the middle of these uh, little chambers with some strange crystals and they would all kind of tune in to what was at the centre of the place which was some enormous great multifaceted Shiva Lingam type crystal. There was literally some kind of multi-dimensional vortex and these tonal sounds would kind of start to um, be in tone and come out of these crystals and this sound literally kept the entire, you know, kept the whole earth in, in harmony and the guys that were doing this were pretty damn weird this was a painting that the uh deb did uh in 1992 a bit akhenaten like called and he called them the elders you know they were not standing issue homo sapiens sapiens they weren't aliens they absolutely were not aliens but they were not our current standard issue. And for those of you who know where Andy's work is now with the Denisovians and Gebekli Tepe, this idea of another strand of unknown humanity feeding into <coughs> the main culture stream. Pretty much started with him, with Bernard coming up with his idea of these very tall, very pale, viper visage dudes. And these guys in turn uh, generated, you know, further generations, the Watchers, the Nephilim, and these guys, there came a point there'd been a catastrophe, basically. Something went wrong with the Earth's climate, maybe there's a comet here or whatever, and the crystal chambers are, are shut down, and the, the, the crystals that the different people have got disperse. And needless to say, um, some of them, well, one of them comes here and is in hyperspace like some Tibetan term of treasure. And some of these guys do, do a tour, and this is Anne Sudworth's amazing painting uh, situated down at the Lizard in Cornwall, which some of you might recognise the rock profile there that was her um, cover for a novel that Storm Constantine wrote, uh, based on a lot of the psychic material that uh, Debbie was coming up with about British tour from these guys, where they turned up in, in Glastonbury and so on, and the Zodiac, blah, blah, blah. This is part of the immense uh, task I've set myself with the Queer of Phoenix because there's another whole bunch of tapes and a whole bunch of stuff to set in motion there. All this was going on in, in 95, 96, 97 and this stuff is a bit freaking powerful. You know, it, it's, it's not all sweetness and light. These characters <coughs> were, at the very least, amoral. Okay, uh, they would not have quite the same sensibilities as we had, and we did find that people were getting a bit warped out by it. And it's kind of this is an interesting photo actually taken in 1996 of me and Andy, and you can kind of see, you know, Andy and all his posse are all looking like something out of the Fields of Nephilim video, uh, <laughs> and I've come from Glastonbury and I'm all in white and all the rest of it. 
and it's kind of you know I kind of felt I, I love all that stuff but I kind of felt that, that you know I'm standing apart from it here in Glastonbury with all the influences that I've got there's something going on here that I have, have got to bring to this um, some mission that I'm on So in May 1997, um, an American lady called Shanti Moy, who's uh, actually the head of the Hindu village, came to Glastonbury offering initiation into the famous Gyatri Mantra, the, the mother of the Vedas. You can see the sort of the Hindu version of it there. We meditate on that most adorable, desirable and enchanting lustre and brilliance of our supreme being, our source energy, our collective consciousness, who is our creator, inspirer and source of eternal joy. May this warm and loving light inspire and guide our mind, mind and open our hearts. Now what she was going to do, you know, she sat in the usual sat saying, gave Upanishadic type discourses and, you know, you can always tell with these people, she was carrying the vibe, she was, she was for real. But she was also offering initiation into the mantra, which meant a one-on-one, -on -one where she basically touched you on the head and, and sung the mantra quietly in your ear. Uh, and she was part of a pretty amazing lineage. I mean, I, 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 you know, I have not got enough time to do justice to these guys. But the first guy, Kashi Baba, is virtually an adorable dude, very controversial. Uh, in his time, but he ended up meeting the future George V when he was visiting India. And there was a whole interesting interaction with him. Uh, and enormous great ashrams get built as we move down the lineage. And they're reciting different mantras 24 7 for flipping decades. Stuff that's very, very ancient. And this is, you know, the Gyatri goddess, if you like. And one of the things that, you know, this is fantastic, I, you know, I love that stuff and the idea of getting initiated into a mantra, I'd never had that kind of thing happen to me before, so I obviously went for that. But one of the things that Shanti Mai was going to do, and this happened on May the 12th, 1997, so it's just over 20 years ago, was she did this amazing ceremony at the bottom of the tour where an oak tree was, was planted, you know, a local... Uh, you know, especially um, prepared oak sapling, local, maneuvered into this, this threshold in the ground and all, you know, the amount of poja that was put into this, all these esoteric goodies were bunged in with it. You know, crystal shiva, lingam, ash from sacred fires in Rishikesh, from the burning gats in Varanasi, stuff from the, you know, bits of soil from the tombs of, of, of the lineage of all the saints, cotton that had been grown on the grave of one of them, flowers from the tomb of Anandamai Ma, you know, sand from the Tibetan Kalashakra Mandala, the whole lot is just all put in there and all this chanting and blah, blah, blah. It's absolutely stonking. And something's kind of going on in my head here. You know, something is going on in my head because there is a thing, if you like, there is a thing that could be called Hindu Druidism. Was, was first became, you know, known, translated as a language. There were people that were trying to link together what was known about the Celts and their society, what was known about, um, you know, Hindu society, you know, the Brahmins, the Druids, blah, blah, blah. And this has ebbed and flowed in terms of like, what the academic credibility of it is. And, Iola McGann Wig, who was responsible for the Welsh Triads, he put a little bit of this in there. And here and there in the 19th century, antiquarian Nutter Vickers would sort of wander off the reservation with all kinds of wild speculations about all this sort of stuff, but it won't go away. It won't go away. In fact, even recently I read, I think it was somebody at Harvard, a linguist, who had been looking at Gaelic and Sanskrit and finding stuff in Irish literature. Uh, that seemed to be very, very resonant with stuff that was in Sanskrit and dates back to Vedic times. So, I, I know a little bit of this, and when I, I had all this, this idea of this poetry just exploded in my brain. And I obviously started, you know, I started thinking about Druidry. I started thinking about what you might call the mythology 
or Drew Drake. You can see now I've read Roald Atten's book, Blood and Missing So great book. Love to get the, the history right. I am a history nerd. I started off as a history nerd. I love to get it right. But I'm also quite happy um, when the inspiration is there <coughs> to just run with it. You know, with stuff that just doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Blake Salbian, the personification of our land, our nation. Blake, a shaman, a visionary, a patriot, but a totally unorthodox patriot. A patriot that is not into royal family, he's not into politics, but he's into something far more deeper. Somebody who equates imagination with Christ himself, Christ itself, that there is something truly divine about imagination in its greatest capacity. I started reading John Michel's, you know, 12 Tribe Nations again, within the <coughs> days of the Shanty Moy Puja. Uh, if anybody hasn't read <coughs> Jeffrey Ash's Camelot and the Vision of Albion, I, I can't recommend it highly enough as a sense <coughs> of how what Blake was tuning into and what he expressed uh, was something that is eternal, that is something that's also, you know, the, the idea that, you know, the acts of Arthur, the stories of Arthur are, are in some respects the stories of, Al of Albion applied to, you know, a, a fifth century prince and so on. Uh, you know, that famous sort of quote that all things begin and end in Albion's ancient druid rocky shore. I love the fact that on Primrose Hill you have a kind of mashup of Iola McGanwig's Druid Revival that began in 1792. And you've also got a William Blake quote actually carved into the ground man there. There are Druid orders that, that claim William Blake as, as a chief, although William Blake's biography is very difficult to pin that one down. Although at one point he lived uh, doors away from where a Druid order at the time were meeting. It's, there's something right about it in terms of you know, it's the archetype of the Druid. I think there are two words, which is one of them, uh, and Druid is another one. They are very powerful archetypes. They, they, they set you off. They set you off. And now, you know, our original sources for classical times, people like Julius Caesar and so on, people just debate it forever and ever. What did they look like? What did they really do? But some of us, when we see this, we love it, all right? Some people will laugh at it. Others of us feel some strange thing that whereby each successive age is always reworking the mythology, is always finding something that emotionally inspires them to express something of that, something eternal, you know, through the imagery of that time. And art and creativity is constantly using that. You know, uh, we're doing that all the time here. You know, we, we do that more here than most places do. So. Yeah, okay, we know uh, that the mythology of the Druids and the stone circles that was knocking about, still knocking about even when I was a child actually, uh, doesn't quite cut it. We know the outfits are, and, and, and the jewellery and the headgear and all the rest of it, it's 18th and 19th century. Wrap the archetype around <coughs> yourself and see you know, what starts to happen. It's very kind of interesting. and. Before I lead into the, you know, the main druidic story here, in terms of this idea of the potency of wrapping the archetype around yourself, and so many of you uh, will know Nick Mann and will know the fantastic work that he's done relating to the astronomical alignments in the landscape here, and the whole thing with um, you know, going up on the hills and being able to see the sun rise up beside the tall on the winter solstice. He's brought all that out. And there was a time, some time before that, where he got himself involved in Druidism and he created a little Druidic college type thing that he was promoting and so on. And I said to him, do you think that it was partly as a result of wrapping yourself round with that mantle of, of entering into that archetype of Druidry? You know, the, the sources tell us that they're the great astronomers that they know all of this stuff about the evidence. Do you think you were able to get that download because you'd switched on that emotional part of your consciousness? And he said he'd never thought of it in that way before, but he was not, you know, he would not rule it out. There was something there in this. 
Now I was strongly involved with the Fellowship of ISIS at the time, the mid nineties, and so were a number. You know, although Andy and company have gone all fields and nephilim, a number of the people around him who were part of the White Leaf Dog Seven Sword thing, like Caroline Wise and John Merrin. Uh, and the like Steve Wilson, they were all part of, of the Fellowship of ISIS as well. And, you know, I'm sure we all know enough about Olivia that she played a very big role in bringing back the Divine Feminine and the sense of mystery cults that work on the inner plane that have a kind of connection that goes way, way back and are still, you know, very much a force if you approach them with the right attitude and the full the eclecticism, something of, of the emotions involved in that, that right attitude is, is what the Fellowship of Isis brought about. And then was also very interested in, in Druidry, you know, she was living in Ireland, it, issues with Ross Nichols, who was quite a big figure in, in you know, the recent revival of Druidism. And she founded a Druid clan of Dana, and it's one of the classic paintings of, of, of Dana and Olivia, I think, it's a, I think it's a Parliament Hill. She got herself, managed to get herself involved with all the other Druids in this country and part of the general ceremonial. And I knew that, you know, I had a friend in town who was in the Druid clan of Dana and I started kind of, really started to think about it. Because the mythology of, of Dana or Danu, as she's also known, was, was pretty perfect for my, my blend at the time. There's a Celtic creation myth, or at least it's told that way in the present day again, who knows how old think this really is, but there's a period of primal chaos when the sky was dark and turbulent and a few drops of water began to fall and they increased the intensity until the dry earth is soaked and fertilised and life began. And these waters were Dana. And the most notable of all the things that grew was an oak tree called Bile. Dana and Bilo became the primal parents of the gods and humanity. And two acorns, Dark Dagda and, and Bridget, brought forth the fabled children of Dano, the twelfth of the name. That's a version of it. So, you know, I had a friend in Glastonbury called Fame McBride, I said she was, was known then, who was in the dream clan of Dana, and I just suddenly felt that I needed to talk to her in detail about it. So I had a chat with her, and again, it's a good thing to, to keep diaries. This was May the 20th, so it's really not that long after the Shanty <laughs> Way ceremony. And after I spoke to her, I had what I wrote in my diary, a thoroughly delirious night. I passed in and out of sleep, had vivid dreams. The whole shebang, waking and dreaming, is all a one basic theme. And it lasted all night and completely dominated. I was working in the factory at the time. The whole day that I was in the factory, I just thought about nothing else. And I described it as an overwhelming obsession in the, in the way that Robert Graves was overwhelmed by the writing of the White Goddess. And it carried on and on into the evening. I've got to get together a group of people, go to White Leaf Dog, be initiated into the Druid Clan of Dana by fee right there, and at the Oak as well, and found from Glastonbury a, a grove of the enchanted landscape and make a very tangible link with White Leaf Oak. And then, and this is clearly the Shanty My inspiration coming through, try and take Earth, get Earth from a whole bunch of sacred sites around the country like Glastonbury and Avebury and Silbury and so on. Water from sacred rivers and wells, you know, the obvious chalice well, the river Thames, blah, 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 and bring it all to that oak and bury it within 20 feet or so of the main thing. And then after a year of that, and when all the seven sword ceremonies are complete, go back to what they've done and harvest acorns from that oak, from the oaks around, and plant as many oaks around the country as they come out to millennium uh, as possible, ideally, at sacred sites. So this was an absolute, total flipping brainstorm. And at the same time, uh, there was a musician in Glasgow called David Easter, he's still about from time to time. And I uh, talked to him about basically creating a musical fantasia on the idea of the history of perpetual choirs. That you take certain bits of music, I mean you steal it really. Um, Thomas Tallis's Steminarium, 
a fantastic bit of cool music that evokes the, uh, the, the liturgy of the time of Glastonbury Abbey and um, various songs and so on, put in, in other versions, create something that goes from uh, the Stone Age and the time of the Great Mother, through the Christian era, uh, up to the Global Orm mix in the current day. And he, he managed to produce a, a version of what he called it the Bridget mix of, of the, um, the Fisher King song. And all this was put together, and that was, was played in Glastonbury on, on more than one occasion, all round about the same period of time. So the way it all worked out, you know, so that was end of May. I was working in this factory, uh, what's now Avalon Plastics, it was then the notorious Imco Plastics. And the way they worked, they just took a week off at the end of February, and that was that, and that's when part of the holiday was. So that determined when I could go, and I talked to various people, and you know, some people could go on one day, and others couldn't, and blah, blah. We ended up, we could all go on May the 29th. So a group of us uh, went up there, uh, myself, Fee McBride, David Eastow, uh, Senior Thomas was here tonight, uh, my girlfriend at the time, Chen Deera. We went there and we went to the Oak. And, you know, as an example of how my brain was working at the time, you know, again, this is before Photoshop or anything like that. Uh, I, w I wish I could remember who the artist was. There were a bunch of, of postcards on sale in Glastonbury which had druids at places like Avery and Glastonbury and I just cut them out basically and stuck them with the tree. <laughs> and you know, there's someone playing the trumpet there and it was just kind of this mythology and that imagery was followed through into, into Yuri's drawing. And so we did a whole thing there, you know, this is, is the view from, from the top of Ragged Stone Hill. That's, that's probably the best, best place to go to. And the idea was at the bottom of that hill, you could see there's all trees and stuff. Um, Fee was going to take me into, uh, off on the own and do this uh, Druid Clan and Dino initiation with me uh, in, uh, amidst the, the woods at the bottom of the hill. And you know, I went into full, dru yeah, full Druidic nutter mode. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely up for it. There we are coming up the hill after doing this number, and you can see that I'm, I'm fully engaged in the, in the mythology there. And I've got to say, um, you know, to my girlfriend at the time, took all the pictures as Chandira up the tree. So we've gone there on 29th of May. The next day, back in Glastonbury, and I'm browsing through courtyard books. Hang on a minute, the 29th of May is Royal Oak Day, which actually I hadn't consciously really, although I knew this story, I never even knew that it was had once been a national holiday. This is a famous episode, once famous, I should say, episode in British history where Charles II, after a battle at Worcester, hid from all of the Cromwell's troops up the tree. And when he, he came back and was restored, uh, his birthday, which was the 29th of May, uh, was, was called Oak Apple Day, Royal Oak Day, was made a national holiday. And this holiday persisted right up until, in, uh, I think it was 1859, it was a national holiday. And you will find echoes of this all over the place in Royal Oak pub signs, which sometimes are quite interesting in their design. And also, in the midst of all of this, some real weird old folklore stuff seems to sort of ride on the back of this, even to this day. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that happens on Royal Oak Day. This is something, you know, somebody completely covered in flowers, being paraded through, you know, a town in the Midlands on horseback. So that was, you know, that's the, the mere fact that we had somehow gone to Whiteleaf Oak and I'd been initiated into Drew Planet Diner on Royal Oak Day, when none of us had even known that it was Royal Oak Day, felt quite interesting. But uh, in the same. At the same time, you know, this is browsing through courtyard books. I find a picture uh, of the Queen, or Princess Elizabeth, as she then was, uh, being kind of initiated into this druidic Gorset scenario. Um, which is kind of pretty, you know, I didn't know anything about anything like this at the time, and it's kind of mind bending. This is 1946, to say, you know, the Queen in Wales, in the midst of all this stuff going on, uh, you know, there's even some film footage of it uh, on YouTube from the old Cafe News. 
And it goes back further than that because his appearance when they were Duke and Duchess of York, you know, this, this whole thing. Now, what was, what was weird to me was the previous year I'd gone up to White Leaf Dove for my first participation in, in Seven Swords and I'd gone via Bristol Temple Mates. And when I was there, I had about an hour wait for a train. And I noticed on the other side, uh, on the platform opposite, there was loads of people gathering, people with cameras. So I said, what's going on there when the Queen's passing through? So I thought, got an hour, I'd go over there. And you know, the world, world train pulls in, and that's the only time in my life that I've ever actually seen the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh right up close. They got out of the train, walked past, went in there. And I'm on my way to the Seven Souls at White Leaf Dove, and it felt a bit weird. So a year later, all this comes in. And this basically said to me, look, this you know, whole enchanted landscape, Druid Clan of Dana, this Druid mythology which seems completely bonkers. Look how all this is configured. You know, there's something that you have to go along with here. A year goes by, and I'm starting to ponder the great mystical artist Nicholas Rurick. And I was aware of the fact that we were coming up at the end of the year to the 20th anniversary of his death. And I thought, here I'm in Glastonbury. Surely somebody is going to be putting on a presentation for the great man. And it turned out nobody was, so it's one of those situations. Well, I guess I'm just going to have to, aren't I? <laughs> so in December 1997, I put on a presentation on the life and art of Nicholas Root. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, I realised this a, a, a little while back, a few months back. This year, we're 20 years on from now. The anniversary of the death of Nicholas Rury happens to fall on a Wednesday, so I am going to be doing an updated version of that for you guys. You know, it's probably going to be the next thing I do is going to be Nicholas Rury again. So it is interesting how things go round. And of course, Nicholas Rury's great thing is Shambhala. Here's the outside mountains. Oh my word. Oh my word. You know, the idea that there is some primal ancient wisdom source that in some sense is still spiritually active across the whole planet. Uh, it's so romantic. You know, you either, you know, some people aren't up for it, other people just love it. I love it. And this is, you know, Rurik's whole life is about this. And he was a great explorer all kinds of adventures out there so I'm full of all this stuff and I'm also full of Robert Cohn's ideas about global chakras and he always said you know this whole idea that Glastonbury is the old chakra of the world which just you hear it so often now quite often people you know a lot of people seem to have forgotten that basically Robert Cohn is the person that put this idea out you know really almost for the first time um, whatever you think of it, he deserves credit for that. And he has all these global chakra sites, people made a lot of mileage out of it, but one of them, the sixth, you know, the sixth chakra, the third eye, is mobile. The shambolic focus is mobile. As far as he was concerned, it's currently located in Glastonbury. So, you know, this is a big enough idea anyway, but I remember back in the 80s, there's a guy called Stephen Jenkins, he was quite a big deal um, when it comes to Glastonbury law in the 80s. He featured a few TV documentaries, you know, a number of you, you might remember this stuff. And Geoffrey Ash talks about him in Avalon Quest. He was a mystical school teacher. His book, The Undiscovered Country, is classic old school lay hunting, <coughs> in lays with ghosts and UFOs and all sorts of stuff. He works in Mongolia and he was heavily into the form of Tibetan Buddhism and the Kalashaka stuff that they got. And they were really big on trying to work out where was, where is Shambhala. And they talked to him about this at length. And, you know, there was a story that a Celt had come and visited Buddha, so on and so forth. Well, anyway, what he took away from all this, what they left him with, was that Shambhala was Glastonbury. Uh, no, so for a while, you know, this idea was, was floating about and people were really buzzing with it. It's a wild idea. Of course it fucking is. But uh, I love that idea nonetheless. 
because that idea of, of bringing the different traditions, the matter of Britain, the matter of the world together was something that was important to me. And in uh, the original version of this book by Monica Sun, which was uh, New Age and Armageddon, I encountered uh, the work of Sultra Malioni, an American uh, Buddhist nun, who had got this incredible idea of you know, working with the energies of Shambhala, working with the Dakini Mandala, asking the indigenous site guardians permission to bring the Dakini Mandala down into the landscape and you know, basically purifying the karmas of a place with the energies of Shambhala. And I thought, well, yeah, okay, we'll have some of that. That sounds flipping marvellous. Now, there's the Dakini Mandala. At this stage, it's now 1998, we're leading into the last of the seven soul ceremonies. And it's like, you know, this is heavy stuff, man. Nephilim, blah, blah, blah. Why not go a medicine Buddha puja of white leafed oak and purify the karmas of the petrol choir, you know, with the energies of Shambhala? Now, what a bonkers idea, but, you know, we loved it. So a posse of us went off there. And Phil Stretch is here with us today, but he'd been initiated into um, the Medicine Buddha, uh, in Medicine Buddha ceremonial. He was able to do this thing, and most importantly of all, he could do the old. Because you've got to have some of that. You've got to have some of that. <laughs> so we went there, you know, we offered up uh, bourbon biscuits and so on, on Ragged Stone Hill with them, you know, I call it the Medicine Buddha, and I think we bought a few bits and pieces in keeping with the just, you know, bring everything possible at White Leaf Oak and, uh, and put it all in the, in the blender there. So I'd had my manifestation the year before, you know, some pretty unusual stuff had happened when I'd got the white leaf oak to be initiated into the Druid clan of Dawn. And we'd got Royal Oak Day, we'd find out the Queen was, you know, dressed up as a Druid and all this sort of stuff. What the hell does it take to prove to you that you're a winner when you do something this bizarre? Well, we went back into Ledbury, which is the nearest town major town to White Leaf Dog, there's no shops at White Leaf Dog, it's a tiny, tiny little place. And we wanted to have that to eat, but I don't know, something was going on, there was some road rage incident going on, a couple of guys got out of, out of the car and were having shouting at each other, we thought, no, 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 we'll, just, we'll go to the next town, we'll get in the car, we'll just, we'll just go to the next town. And we ended up in, in ross on white And it was literally a case of just park the car, wherever you can in the ice street and get out and look around. So we got out of the car and literally right over the road is this place. Now now it's, it's a Gurkha restaurant, but in those days it's a Tibetan restaurant. It's still, it was called Yaks and Yetis then. You don't see an awful lot of Tibetan restaurants. So it's obvious, isn't it? We're going in there, of course we are. So we go in there and it's dimly lit you know, and there's all tankers all over the wall and all the rest of it, and you know, table for our many. We sit down, and I'm just ushered in, and I'm sitting next to Chen Deer and Phil and David East over front of me. They're both looking at me and they're smiling. I've hardly paid attention. They look behind you. I look behind me, and I'm sitting right in front of this giant tanker of the Medicine Buddha. So, you know, that obviously was enough for me, you know, to say, yeah, result. This is the conversation that we had in 1989, nearly 10 years before we blend together the map of Britain and the map of the world. So this was the idea I had, uh, and you know, he, he gladly went along with it. We had some tape recordings of the tones that the elder race had sounded in the crystal chambers underneath <coughs> the geyser plateau with their weird crystals. We would send people out to all the points of the Decagon simultaneously, stake them out there. We would do, we on Ragstone Hill at the centre of, of the whole White Leaf Doak operation, we would do the whole visualisation of going into the Crystal Chambers. And at a certain point, I think it was two o'clock in the afternoon, 
all around the Decagon, there would be people listening to this tape simultaneously. And depending on what the site was, they would be imagining different coloured beams of light going towards White Leaf Oak. And that would be, you know, a massive great sand in this tone. I think one place, I think it was this Lake of Light place, we couldn't get anyone there. All the other places, in some places there were there were multiple um, things going on. There were people on Wirral Hill, there were people on Glastonbury Tour. Other places there were just a couple of people. A couple of places there was literally just one person with a walkman and they found their way out there and we did it all simultaneously and this is us on this is literally just before we start doing it there's there's me and Andy and Deb and Caroline Wise is visible and also in the foreground the late Steve Wilson. Uh, a few moments after that uh, we did we started getting this, this visualisation and, and at the end of all of that I think somebody saw some like Quetzalcoatl type serpent burst out of the ground and go up into the middle of the stargate. It was all flipping pretty, you know, as if you're going to do something like that and you're not going to get your head matched. Of course you are. It was absolutely epic and I think nearly 20 years later we're still <coughs> following through all the ripples of it. And this is all very flipping far out, very cosmic and very abstract and, and difficult perhaps to be to relate to on a, on a human level. Uh, this is my back garden a while ago, it's not my back garden anymore, I'm very sad to say, but in the foreground, on the left, is a sapling from white leafed oak, mm -hmm. and on the right, you know, another <coughs> one from story. This is not the, back at the end of the 90s I presented some of this material, and there was a guy who turned up and really resonated with it, and he had a thing about Sherwood Forest and the oak at Sherwood. You know, that old rock, you know, Robin Hood, not historical, blah, blah, blah. But that oak carries a lot of vibe, man, it definitely does. Uh, so he thought it would be great to go there and harvest some acorns from that. So he went there, and he literally slept at the foot of the oak. And something woke him up, you know, at daylight. He looked around and the entire tree was surrounded by a bunch of people all dressed up in costumes with Robin Hood and his merry men, you know, and doing some kind of photo shoot. So he just, you know, he's got his own calls and he just walks out through these people in a way and he thought, well, yeah, okay. So, so one of those like, all this is growing out of that tub on the right. I think, you know, I haven't got garden anymore. I think Yuri's got them now. But this is what we did, you know, I went back to White Leaf Dope and we harvested acorns and we dished them out and people, you know, I, I've got all the details somewhere, I lost track of it, it's back at the end of the 90s now. This stuff happened, this stuff happened. And, you know, Andy's odyssey went on because he did end up, you know, as a result of this crazy story, uh, you know, rediscovering a previously lost cave system on the Giza Plateau and that is all up and running. And then from time to time since, the whole perpetual choir concept has come back and inspired me and further things have happened. Right at the end of 2012, for example, I was contacted by musician Toby Marks, aka Banco de Gaia, who was preparing a musical pro project inspired by that theme. And I met up with him a few times, talked to him about a lot of the things I've talked about in this lecture. Played him the Fish King song. He ended up, at the start of 2013, presenting what was in many respects as much uh, an art installation as a musical gig at the Rural Life Museum, the old Abbey Barn in Beer Lane. Very, very interesting. It shows that something of the theme, the archetype, is always going to resonate with people of a certain temperament. And at the time this lecture was recorded and I've been recording this additional material. The whole Psychic Questing crew returned for the first time in nearly 20 years to White Leaf Oak, and all manner of fun and games resulted.
So the inspiration from the idea it acquires continues and I hope very much that something of all of these ideas lands right with those of you that are listening to this material and that you can find your own inspirations, go on your own journeys, experience your own creativity, perhaps your own mystical odysseys and in our own way we can all help the choir to be heard and to sing again on this new twist of the time spiral. And afterwards, at the end of this sequence, you can hear the version of We're All Part of the Goddess that I alluded to earlier that Debbie picked up out of thin air in the summer of 1990. It's all in the airwaves, people. Tune in. We are a part of the goddess And to her we shall return Like a drop of rain Merging with the ocean Asher, Apple, Sephony, Sunny, Kerestine All of these things are present in me I am great, I see his body is the sea, and all of life comes from within me. We call her from the moon, we call her from the sand, we call her from the stars, and we call her from the light. From the moon, she is our sun, in the sea, she's our sound, from the light, she is a horse carved white upon the ground. We are a part of the goddess. And to her we shall return Like a drop of rain Merging with the ocean Caridwin, Morrig and Diana, Hecate All of this power be present in me I am the boundless dark bitter sea And life in its end shall return to me in the tomb you see me black, in the temple I am gold, in your heart I glow the colour from the oceans of old. I control the tides of your destiny and dream in icy sun, veiled is Ellen Binergy. We are a part of the goddess, and to her we shall return like a drop.